And well, welcome to this second event in the ENCODE Filecoin uh, series, educational series, uh, which runs both in its, this, its kind of first guys, the education guys, uh, for um, a number of weeks. Uh, we're running, I think, uh, 12 events in total, uh, to teaching you everything about uh, Filecoin from the ground up. Uh, and the whole kind of ecosystem, IPFS, all of the kind of various things you, you want to really know about the Filecoin ecosystem, which is completely open for both beginners and those you, who are uh, kind of more experienced, who, who want to learn more. And so you'll find that kind of events start off a little bit more simple and, and go into kind of more depth as we kind of both pro pro progress through the various weeks and in the events themselves. Um, this, I said, as I said, is event two. Um, we, after this education series, for those who weren't with us last week, and, and George and Danny will post some links as I'm talking. Uh, maybe we can repost the links. Uh, I know some of you joined earlier, but we can repost them. Uh, so, because I'm going to answer the question from uh, Razim here. Yes, everything's on YouTube, everything's on Medium, everything's on the website. All this content will be available on demand uh, for your uh, enjoyment. Uh, obviously, we like you coming to the events because you can ask questions. But after the education series is over, we're going into a uh, Farcoin hackathon which should be very fun, global university hackathon. And uh, hopefully uh, you will answer lots of challenges and lots of prizes. I've enjoyed a good time uh, building stuff uh, with that kind of more broad uh, Farcoin set of technologies. Uh, and also after that, we finish with an accelerator. We hopefully take the best hackathon projects and make them into startups. Uh, should be very, very fun. Um, lots of links will go into the chat, uh, the Discord link, uh, the event summaries, uh, event rights for future weeks, uh, the websites. Uh, in all their different forms. But I want to, without further delay, introduce uh, Hector uh, San Juan, who is a, a software engineer uh, at, um, at uh, Protocol Labs. Uh, and uh, he's going to talk to you today about IPFS, all things you need to know and would want to know. Uh, and uh, we're delighted, Hector, to have you with us, uh, well, this evening for, for me and probably this evening for you as well. We know a lot of people are joining from the morning or even late night. Uh, so thank you all for joining. Hector, great to have you with us. And we're really looking forward to your presentation. So, so over to you. Thank you very much, Anthony. So, uh, let's hope this works. Can you confirm that my screen is visible? Very Please. much confirmed. It looks good. <laughs> okay. I can even make it. All right. Um, hi, everyone. It's very good to be here giving you this presentation. Uh, my name is Hector San Juan. I work at Protocol Labs. I do a bunch of things there right now, very focused on something that we call Sentinel, which does file going chain analysis and monitoring. But I've also done my first share of IPFS stack uh, things in my tenure here. I'm pretty much working with uh, every every of the parts that make the whole the whole IPFS stack. And today I'm here to give an introduction to the technology behind IPFS, how it works, in hopefully ways that are easy to understand, not going too deeply into details, but also since we have plenty of time, I will be also live demoing, so trying on my command line and sharing it with you to see how, how to work with IPFS, how to run commands, what happens when you have content, and so on. So as I said, IPFS is made up of many parts, which are a wider ecosystem. So this P2P is perhaps the most prominent. It's a peer-to-peer -peer library that can be used for anything to just have peers in a peer-to-peer -peer application. It is started as part of IPFS. It is now a completely full and independent project. And of course, it is used outside of IPFS in Ethereum, in Filecoin, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and some other projects. You, if you were here last week, you already had an introduction and you touched on, on quite a few of the concepts that we're going to see. In following weeks, uh, you will also have the opportunity to learn more about Filecoin Leap P2P. But as you see, IPFS inscribes itself 
and what we see as a key building block in the journey towards a better peer-to-peer -peer web. And we see this from two sides. The first one is that we think that the distributed web is the way of addressing the technological, technological challenges of the future in a planet where we are more connected, where data circulates and plays a bigger and bigger role. But we also think that this data and this knowledge that is encoded in this data are one of the most important assets to, hum to humanity and therefore must be safeguarded, must be open, and must be in the hands of the people. So IPFS is sure not the answer to all the problems, but I think it represents a very nice building block in, in making this Web3 generation actually possible and, and removing a lot of the barriers and a lot of the silos that we have around data. So what is IPFS? So IPFS is the interplanetary file system. The first part is what is a file system? File system is just files and folders. There's like not too much else to it other than what you already know. You have folders, they can have files inside, they can have other folders and you can traverse them. You can create paths that indicate which which of the things in those files and folders you, you want to, to open or, or read. And the other part is interplanetary. Uh, the interplanetary name was chosen because it was thought as a way to upgrade the web in, in a way that if the network stretches across planets, it will still work. So imagine that you're in Mars and you're browsing the web and you have to go back to Earth. Your message needs to go back to Earth and you need to get a reply, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. It's gonna take very long. Now, if the content that you were looking for was already in Mars because it had been accessed before, it had been copied from Earth before, you will be able to, you should be able to access that content immediately because it's available locally in that planet. Uh, and the solution to that should be provided transparently by the protocol, not, not by something built ad hoc on top. And therefore, this is where the this is where the whole interplanetary um, name fits in. Uh, as we will see, IPFS is distributed by design. Uh, no central authoritative server storing content. No central server needs to be contacted to obtain the content. And I'm going to say all the all, I'm going to explain all the key technologies that make this possible, and and how they fit together. So for that, we need to look into how we put our data up online. Usually you will upload your data to a server, to a location, and anyone wanting to download that data will have to get it from that location. I think you touched on a lot of these contents uh, last week. Uh, with IPFS, things are slightly different. You run an IPFS peer and you become the server of that content. You do not upload content anywhere and still you add it to your peer and make it discoverable by everyone else. Any content that is published on IPFS uses content addressing, which is a way of referencing a piece of data by its hash. So to touch again on, on things that, that were mentioned on the previous session, the, 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 the file system has files and folders. The web is not different to this. You still have your path to the actual file that you want to read. And when you're opening a website, you're just opening some files. The difference is that they need to, to be downloaded from that remote location. And of course the browser will do that for you and will actually interpret the HTML and print pretty things on your screen. With IPFS, you're also obtaining files from a remote location potentially. But the key difference is that we do not need to know that location. We need to we need to know the identifier of the content, the content identifier. Uh, the content is still at one location or several locations, but it does not matter to us anymore where it is. The protocol itself will figure out 
where to get that content from. And, and if we have that system, if we have that baked in into the protocol, we are able to switch from, from these location-based identifiers to a content address uh, system where everything is identified by CID. And as you saw, that implies that you can trust that content. Every CID, just to touch again on, on what was said, or if anyone wasn't there, is a cryptographic fingerprint of a piece of content. Every piece of content produces a different fingerprint. Usually, if they're using the same function to generate that fingerprint, the fingerprints will be of the same size and with the same properties, regardless of the amount of content that you're processing through to create that, that fingerprint. In the IPFS world, we work with CID. This is our name for the fingerprints for the hashes. And they can be reproduced anytime that you have the original content. That means that if you obtain a piece of content by using its CID, you can rehash it. You can immediately verify that the content matches the CID that you used uh, to obtain it. I see a lot of uh, chat uh, activity, but I kind of play, pay attention to the chat and I'm happy to answer questions uh, at different places in the presentation because otherwise it becomes very messy. Um, but thank you all. Um, so it is more or less clear. If I have a file, I'm just going to hash it. I'm going to do SHA-256. I'm going to obtain an identifier, and I can then read my file using that identifier in the IPFS system. But if we're talking about a uh, file system, we're also talking about folders. And in this case, folders are not different from files. A folder is just a special file, which inside, inside lifts the actual, the actual content in that folder. So that list gives you the name of the file in that folder and a CID, a reference to the actual content. Since a folder is just a file, you can see it as a special type of file. You can obtain a CID for that folder in exactly the same way. And therefore, you can end up representing a whole file structure, a whole file system, using this type of linked uh, structures, which is what we see here. We see a, a folder structure. And the top level folder has something that we call the root CID. It has two entries corresponding to two folders. And those folders have other entries corresponding to files, et cetera, et cetera. Each different entry in those folders has a different fingerprint, which I color coded uh, with different colors. And this type of a structure, which is content address, everything in this structure is content address, uh, is what we call Merkle lags. So Merkle lags are used by IPFS to move from a location based addressing to content based addressing in a single, in a single step by just replacing the location is something that come uh, thing with the root CID of that content. Uh, the translation is immediate because once you do that, you can still keep the path that you have before and you can still keep the name that you have before. And you can potentially have yes, your root CID slash user one slash abc.doc, just like you will access that on a web location using the URL path. Uh, blockchain is just a particular example from Merkle Lag, where there's usually a single, a single, a single branch of linked blocks. But it is also a content address data structure where things are linked by their by the hashes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what will happen seeing seen how, how we are organizing folders in a, using numerical DAX and content address uh, structures? What will happen if I want to copy file.txt from this example here 
to the folder of the second user. So that, that would mean two things. First, we did not really have to copy the file. We just have to modify the folder to reference that content. It is very important to, to get in the mind that in IPFS, if two things have the same CID, they are conceptually the same. You can have copies on several locations, but conceptually in your system, they're exactly the same thing. You, you're not duplicating the content inside two folders. They will be actually referenced to the same content. We call this property deduplication. And in the presentation last week, it is already mentioned how deduplication can happen by, by chunking fleeting files in different fragments in a way that it happens cleverly and you, you can actually not have duplicated fragments inside a, a same file and so on. The duplication also happens in cases like, like this where the same whole file is referenced uh, from several places. So IPFS gives you a framework to take advantage of such optimizations when it comes to the application. But most importantly, second, since we changed the folder, since we changed the user to folder to add this new file, that folder file, that folder that has the list of files was changed. Therefore, its fingerprint changed. Therefore, if I want to, to keep the whole reference to the, to the same thing, the whole updated reference, I need to update the fingerprint that was pointing to it in the original root folder if and if i update that fingerprint i will have to i will obtain a new root cid your previous cid still references the original structure where you did not make any changes your new cid references the new structure of course those structures share a lot of the data particularly the files are the same the user one folder is the same, but um, it is a, a slightly different, a slightly mutated. So the key here is that a CID will always represent exactly the same piece of information, unlike a location where you could potentially change things. A CID will always represent and point to the same thing. It cannot be altered. If it was altered, you will get a new CID. And that property allows you always to verify that data and to take advantages of, of things that come with that verification and with that data application property. So now that this part is over, I'm happy answering some questions. Cool. Um, Hector, shall I read them out from the chat? Does that help? Yeah, that will help a lot. Perfect. There's been quite a lot. It's been and to be honest, quite an active discussion there as well. Um, let me scroll to the top. Do, 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 do. God, lots of scrolling. Uh, okay. Someone says, what's the difference between IPFS and something like Arweave? I'm not familiar with Arweave. That is fair enough. Uh, what is the difference between protocol labs and Filecoin as a basic introductory question? Um, Filecoin is a blockchain which is developed at protocol lab. Excellent. And that is essentially it. That is good. How many IPFS nodes are there and are there, do, are there any nodes in general? Uh, there are in the tens of thousands IPFS nodes in the public network, according to our latest stats. Okay. I would think that is accurate. I think it's probably around the 10,000, um, but it depends. Yes. It depends uh, on the day and the time. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry, no. Uh, so by cryptographic hash, does it mean hash 256? Um, cryptographic, the hashes that you can use uh, in IPFS, you, you can use any function, any hash function that you like. Normally, by default, we use SHA-256. Uh, you could use anything else because the CIDs, the content identifiers that we use, 
are designed in a way that they support transparently uh, different hashes. Of course, if you use one function, you will get one CID, but if you use a different function, you would use a different CID. But the function, the information about the function that you use is encoded in the CID. Yeah. And therefore you, you always know how to verify the content using the right um, hashing function. Uh, cool. Uh, another question here. Um, can you talk about the ordering of files in the folder um, and ordering multiple folders, if you understand what that means? Yes, it depends on, it depends on, on your address. Um, you're gonna see now what I'm, I'm gonna show how to, how to add some files and we're gonna see how, how the CIDs are returned and so on. But in the practical case, in IPFS, how it works today in the normal implementation is that things will be added in certain order and that order needs to be kept. If you would change that order manually or through some other ways, you will get a different CID because you change the folder. But of course, IPFS will consistently add things in the same order. Uh, cool. Uh, someone asks a basic question. What is a CID? A CID is a content identifier. It is a hash. Perfect. Prepended pre by information about which function you use, prepended by information about which type of content it is it is pointing to yeah etc uh someone asks is there a way to completely delete a cid in a way that it doesn't reference any file um no you can there will be cids that reference files which are not available there are no providers no one has that file therefore no one can give it to you yeah uh, that's going to happen a, a lot or not depends on, on on the content yeah what you can yeah always the cid will correspond to certain content we correspond to the output of a shaft function and of course you can generate very many random cids for many random inputs but that's it uh cool uh is that since ipfs is a public network is there any way to establish permission rules Mm, no, they seem by default. Um, you can run your IPFS daemon in private network mode, and therefore you don't have to, to run on the public network. If you're running on the public network, we always recommend to encrypt uh, content if the content is sensitive. Yeah. And what, what about access control to that content? There are no access controls in, in, in the public network. If you want something minimally close to access control, you will need to run a private network, which actually enforces some sort of access control. Um, normally the, the supported solution is using a pre-shared key, yeah. but if you want to go further than that, you have to, to develop a solution yourself. And maybe last one before we move on, um, which is kind of an obvious question, how do you handle legal content? It is, IPFS is peer-to-peer, -peer, which means that you are responsible for your own peer and what content you are hosting with that peer. I will mention it later, but your peer is never going to download or store content for other peers. You need to request it first and therefore you're responsible of what, what you're doing with that. You are, you're not storing content for the network. You're not storing the actual content from the network. There's a level of integration that I will explain in a minute in the second part of the presentation. Uh, therefore, you are in control of what your node is storing, but you're also responsible for what your node is, is storing. Perfect. Good. I think let's move on then. Um, yeah. Okay. Back over to you. So, we've been talking about folders and files and how these Merkle DAX structures are created. Therefore, 
rather than doing a, a demo at the end with all of this, I think we can actually jump and, and, and see how this works. Not right now, but that it is very fresh on our mind. On our mind. Uh, you should see the command line. And oh, quick, quick question, Hector. Could you um, improve the, could you zoom in a bit? Uh, people are just saying it's a little bit too small. I am trying. What I can do is mm. Yeah. Ah, I found the shortcut now. Um, that should work. So uh, I can also increase the font size here, really. Yes, yeah. that's the one. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure that works. Oh, yeah, look, fantastic. Um, so what I have here is an IPFS test folder, which we have a very simple file structure with some folders and some files, et cetera, et cetera. For example, we have um, folder A, which has some files in it. I'm gonna add them to IPFS recursively. And what you're gonna see is that I have obtained multiple CIDs, one for each object in this subtree and a final root CID for the whole A folder in which I am. These things are now in IPFS. They are content address and I can use IPFS, for example, to tell me what is inside this folder since I have to scroll manually. So IPFS ls command is going to list the contents of folders similar to the ls command in, in the command line. And it's gonna tell me that this folder that I just added, which I'm content addressing, has uh, another CID inside, which points to a folder called set, and another CID which points to a file. I can cut the files. And that's going to be give me the contents of that file, which is hola, hola. But I can, of course, also do something like referencing the file from the root folder using a path. So the file will be 5160. If I were to Add this file again. If I were to do something like IPFS add, you can see that I obtained exactly the same hash that we had before when I added the folders recursively. Now, these things are in IPFS. If I had a node running, which I don't for the moment, I will start it later. Just to make sure that the, the connection is not taking uh, too much bandwidth and decreases the quality of the, of the stream. If I were to start that node, my node would start advertising this content to the network. We will see how that works. But the important thing here is that as you see, I've added content to IPFS. I have obtained CID and I'm now able to use those CIDs to reference the content, to extract it, and to potentially to download it or to traverse it uh, using the original path. There's something interesting here because if you were here the, last week, they also told you how, how files can be chunked in different chunks. And IPFS does that, but only by default, only if files are larger than 256 kilobytes. 
that means that if I add this whole folder that I have with the, with the whole structure, we see that it gave me the same hashes for the for the original content file one, um, the A folder. I obtained a bunch of other things, but um, I have something called big file here. This file is larger than um, larger than 256k, right? In this case, it's 300k. Um, what IPFS is going to do with that file by default is to chunk it. What is this CID? This CID that I obtained for the for the file, this um, the one that ends in uh, the SQT is the root CID for a chunk file. I can use the IPFS ref command to see that this file actually has. is referencing two blocks and only two blocks. This, this is recursive. Um, this root CID is not actually one file. It's actually a pointer to two different blocks. And those blocks are the ones that have the content for this file, which is uh, random, randomly generated. So there's nothing to show that. But the lesson here is that IPFS will transparently message the content, message the folders, uh, split them uh, in a way that makes sense. So that in this case, you're gonna split uh, a larger file in several blocks, you just so then you can transfer the, those blocks on the network individually, and you can verify them individually uh, on the network. Um, questions here? Can you configure chunk size? Yes. The IPFS add command has a lot of options. You can choose your chunker and you can use size and byte. So this is by default 256 kilobytes. You can increase the chunker, but only up to, uh, I think the network total limit is four megabytes and lift p2p will refuse to transfer anything bigger than that any any single block bigger than that i think we recommend not not going over two megabytes uh, for block size but you can definitely use that um are there any other questions on on the chat anthony that you can run me through maybe Yes, I, I believe I see a couple more um, just around the one you did answer um, about the IPFS um, saving locally. How does IPFS save locally the links between the root CID and the chunks? What IPFS has is a block store. So it's essentially a key value, a key value database where the key will be your CID and the value will be the block. And as I told you, a folder is not different than than the than any other file. So I, if I do this and I look at the root folder, if I obtain, if I try to cut it, it will tell me, yeah, I, I don't know how to show this. This is binary. This is this is a directory. I cannot. Uh, I cannot cut it for you. You can only cut files. But of course, IPFS gives me uh, something like block get, and it's going to print a bunch of binary, something that you cannot really understand. But you can, you can at least make out here that there's this IPFS test. Oh, it didn't, it didn't, ah, interesting. It didn't print the the response on the on the web uh, screen because it is binary. Um, but uh, when you do a block get, you're gonna get exactly the binary block 
that represents that, that directory. That binary block is actually a protobuf. And that protobuf is going to have some fields and some some of the fields are actually the link of that folder. So they will have a name and they will have a byte array in there, which is actually the CID of the things that, that the folder is pointing to. So all in all, it's not overly, overly complicated. And there was a way that this could be decoded, but I don't remember the fact. So I'm not going to do that. Uh, any more questions? Oh, perfect. I think we should be good to good to move on for now. Um, it seems like lots of people helping each other out in the chat there. Wow, thank you very much. So we have our content identifiers. This can happen online or offline. You as you saw, you don't need to run a node to get your content identifiers. The next step is that once my IPFS node is running, once my, my IPFS peer is running and connected to the network, it should announce them. But in order to do that, I want to look briefly into what a peer is in a peer-to-peer -peer network. This will be developed um, when you talk about IPFS, uh, about lib P2P next week, I think. So a peer in a peer-to-peer -peer system is an application that is connected to other peers to form this network. Uh, if you forget about IPFS for a moment and think peers in general, there are things that every peer in this network must have. They need to have a name, in practice, a unique identifier. In practice, a unique identifier that is linked to a cryptographic identity, which can be used to securely communicate to, to other peers. And secondly, it needs to share functionality with other peers in the network. Once I can open a channel to, to a different peer, I need to, both of them need to be able to communicate and, and, and provide the same service. They need to, there needs to be a service that they provide both so that they can do something with it. For example, in the IPFS network, the peers in this network uh, support a number of services or protocols. And one of the, those protocols will be the one that says, hey, I have this CID, please give me the content uh, for it so that I can download it from you. Uh, in order to get there, in order to get to the place where you can download content from a different peer, you need to actually discover those peers that are potentially storing your content. And you need to be able to connect to them. That means you need to know their location. So. The content itself is not, is not tied to a location. The peers are, of course. Their peers will have very concrete IP addresses, very concrete ports, very concrete identities, uh, so that you can actually directly uh, connect to those peers when you need to. Um, the discovery of content happens using the DHT. I think it was touched on last week. It might be probably also described more in depth when talking about lib P2P. The key here is that a DHT, in very simple words, is a distributed database. It's a database with many rows that are stored in different peers. And they're stored in a clever way, a way that allows me to more or less know how likely a peer is to store certain information. In the case of IPFS, there will be two primary pieces of information that a peer is storing in the DHT. First, there will be a piece of information that for every CID gives me which peer ID is storing that, that content. And there will be a second piece of information, which is for every peer ID, it will give me which IP addresses and which protocols can be used to talk to it. So the, the whole process consists in asking the network, hey, who has this information that I'm looking for? Who has, who has stored 
the information about who is providing certain CID in the network. And because, because of these CHT metrics that tell me which peers are most likely to, to store that information, I can search for that and I can, I can see which peers I'm connected to. I can decide which ones are more likely to store information for a certain CID. And I can ask them, hey, I'm connected to you. I want information about which peer IDs are storing uh, this CID. Do you have it? And the peer will be, yes, I have. I'm storing information uh, for that. Or alternatively, they will say, I don't have it, but uh, we are both part of a peer-to-peer -peer network. And I know who is more likely than myself to have that information. Therefore, you should go and ask these other peers. And this is a whole part of the lookup. Once I obtain which peer IDs I'm interested in, I will do a second query, a peer routing query, to obtain which IP addresses um, I can use to actually connect to those peers. I eventually uh, initiate the download of the, of the content. There's two questions here. Okie dokie. Let me look at some questionnaires. Let me just change my view. In a second. Okay. Uh, so, uh, how does it discover the first peer? Says Shershak. Yeah, the IPFS daemon is uh, configured by default with a list of bootstrappers, which are run by, by the IPFS project and which are used solely for the purpose of bootstrap into the network. Um, huh. It's your common marketplace. People will connect there. And once they connect to the bootstrappers, they will start using the DHT to discover other peers in the network and, and becoming well connected. Okay, cool. Uh, can you configure chunk size? Yes, you can configure chunk size when adding content using the flag for the IPFS add command. How does IPFS uh, how does IPFS save locally the link between the root CID and the chunks? Say that again. Sorry. How does IPFS save locally the link between the root CID and the chunks? I, we answered we answered that before. Um, I said that IPFS has a block store which is a key value data store and is storing these these two things and the folders are some protobuf which has links to to other things. Cool. Uh, what is the incentive to host an IPFS node? Uh, good question. Depends on, on what your incentive is to, uh, to the data that you want to provide to the network. Obviously, IPFS is not incentivized. You're not getting paid to... The network doesn't provide facilities to, for you to automatically get paid or have an incentive to store other people, other people's content. That's where Filecoin comes in. And uh, the, the, the thing uh, about IPFS is that as I told you, you're mostly storing and hosting and providing your own content. Is that content of the content that you're interested in providing in your own peer is popular in the network. There will be more providers because uh, once you have certain content, you will, every peer will start advertising it. But uh, there is no baked in incentive to run an IPFS node uh, other than yeah, making sure that certain data is available on the IPFS network. Okay, very good. And that's pretty much it because Discordian, I'm not sure who Discordian is, but I think he's part of Protocol Labs, he's answering lots of them. Uh, but last one here, which Discordians also answered, but I'm going to just uh, let you answer as well so everyone can hear. Um, if I'm asking the DHT for the root CID, how does the DHT find the corresponding chunk CIDs? So the CID will, by default, the DHT will have entries for every CID, not just for the root CID one. Although you can choose to only advertise root CID, 
and then once you are it comes a bit later but once you are connected to a node that has given you the root cid for something it is likely that that node has the whole tree the whole the whole Merkle DAG under under that and you don't have to keep doing DHT requests for that. You're just gonna you're just going to talk directly to that node and, and request the content without having to, to use a DHT every time. Perfect. All right, uh, let's get uh, let's keep going then. Um, yeah. Okay, so a bit of a demo here. The ICFS command has DHT. Uh, Subcommands uh, which are interested, interesting. I'm running my peer now. I have an I have an ID. Uh, I have public addresses. I have a bunch of protocols that my peer support and uh, the other peers in the network support. This is what I told you that the the peers in the network in a peer to peer system they need to. They need to talk the same language for something. So what we're seeing here is that an IPFS peer has implemented all these protocols and they're used for different things uh, when you're running IPFS. And of course, when you go and try to talk to a different peer, you're going to you're going to do something like please can I fetch content from you? So you're going to try to see if that other peer uh, supports the same protocol. In particular, there are things that are versions, and which hopefully the other peer doesn't support the protocol that you want to use, which is the latest version, because that peers in an, in an older version, you will fail fail back to to a previous protocol and be able to use that instead. Um, as a reminder, we added some content. I can add it again, and we have a root CID there, so I can see find providers in the DHT for that root CID. And we see there is at least one provider, which is uh, myself. Um, this is something to be expected. Um, I don't know if uh, someone else will um, be providing this content since I just added, obviously um, just myself, but maybe Uh, um, this will be the command that you can use when you want to see if uh, content is well seeded in the network. You can use IPFS uh, find prof your CID to actually uh, see if that content uh, exists. Perhaps with the IPFS test that folder, or here we have two providers. Three providers because after all uh, I pinned this content before the subfolder in, in some other peers so it is showing uh, separate providers and what I can do now hopefully is IPFS DHT find peer and select one that is in my my peer ID is TM so I can do this and it will tell me that it found that peer and it is actually giving me all the addresses that that peer is advertising on the DHT and that that peer will be uh, reachable on. So internally, when I do IPFS CAT, if I don't have the content available locally, this lookup will happen. It will find props on the DHT and then it will find peer and then it will connect to that peer and then it will initiate the download uh, with BitSwap. Um, the DHT can be used to put uh, yeah, arbitrary values, not only CID, but the commands that are most useful here that, that come most handy are the find peer and find props uh, one. I don't know if I have, statistics for the DHT. 
Um, those are internal, but if you're interested in, in the, you know, how Kadimlia works and how the backups are and so on, you know that the, the IPSS command has you covered as it has a lot of tooling to, to inspect in the state of the DHT, the state of your nodes, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> any questions from this part? I think Discordian is, is chatting through them, so you can, yeah, you can keep going. Okay, thank you. So now you know how content is discovered. And now if the, the last step is to retrieve that content uh, from the IPSS network and download it. We know how to contact the peer holding that content. We know what content we want, so we can receive it and verify it as we receive it and make sure that it matches. Uh, once the content is downloaded, my own peer will start advertising that content um, to the network by becoming uh, a provider. So by adding a record to the DHT saying, I am now a provider for this content. Uh, the protocol that we use to download um, files is BitSwap. I think it was also mentioned uh, last week. It can also do discovery. So BitSwap is also used to, to complement DHT lookup by, by just asking all the people that you're connected with uh, directly if they have a piece of content. And this is how all, it also works. Once you, once you have located that someone has the root CID, you're going to connect to that person and then BitSwap is gonna take over the download of the whole, of the whole Merkle lag, hopefully without having to resort to DHT lookup again, which is a bit, a bit slower. In summary, these whole things come together. Uh, peers, DHT, these are things that are provided by the LIP2P project. The format that we use to, to represent files and folders to transparently chunk things and, and still being able to, to have like a single reference to all the chunks and, and read uh, file contents and put them together. That is uh, data that is Merkle that formatting that is provided by the IPLD project, interplanetary link data. And of course, we have the whole IPFS specific stack uh, protocols like BitSwap, uh, et cetera, et cetera, which uh, are just part of, of, of the IPFS. Everything comes together to distribute this, uh, this file system that, and this network that is uh, completely distributed. As I told you before, in the case of the IPFS here, you have an identifier, you have it can talk to the DHT for routing and discovery. It can do bit swap. It has an adder for chunking files, processing them, obtaining CIDs. And additionally, it has an IPFS. Uh, it's, it has an HTTP API, which is the thing that the, the command line will use to interact with this daemon, with this application that you're running with your computer. And most interest, interestingly, it has an HTTP gateway which is a web server that can be used to access content from the IPFS network. And this is essentially the upgrade path uh, as I will show you to, to move from, from content, uh, from location address web to content address web. Uh, never forget all content is authenticated, no central servers. Content is never pushed to a different peer when adding it. What you're pushing is your reference, you're pushing the information that you're a provider for that for the content, but your peer is not downloading any content uh, from other peers unless you are requesting it. And content can be absolutely anything, particularly anything that that is linked or anything that you can represent through through Merkle back. But uh, it's interesting. So what about the web? So we told you that we moved from domain.com to IPFS slash slash CID index HTML. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. First, the browsers do not understand this protocol at all by default. 
uh, some has started to understand it, but it's also impossible to remember that CID. So that's, that's very close to useless. But I just told you that the IPFS peer runs something called an HTTP gateway. So at least I can use that to rewrite the URL in a way that a browser understands it. I can point to the local gateway, the local URL and local port that my IPFS daemon is exposing and I can access that content uh, through that. Browsers are now happy with this. They have an, a server that is going to serve uh, content to them using the HTTP protocol, which is what they understand. However, it is impossible to remember. Now, we have something called DNS link, and you can use the DNS system to actually create aliases for CIDs. You can add text records to a domain. And you can say for this domain, the CID that should the, that should have that content is this CID. So suddenly you can write your URLs in a way that is actually more more human friendly. You have the same system uh, domains, but now uh, instead of uh, instead of serving as an alias for for IP addresses, you can use them as an alias for for content identifiers or CIDs. Um, more importantly, there's, there are now also uh, distributed domains, uh, Ethereum-based domain, uh, .s, et etc. et cetera, And you can use those uh, also to make this term, uh, term translation if you want to, to be on the most distributed uh, side of things. Now there's still the ugly part of of of, of having to 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 talk to local hosts and having to write the URL like that. That is still not really nice. But you could potentially also use domain.com and make it point to local host and make your node listen on port 80. And you could actually essentially have the same URL that you have at the beginning, but instead of pointing to a location on the web, it's pointing to your local node. And if the user is running IPFS, it will be reading the content from the IPFS network, and it will be using DNS link to find which CID it needs to use, and it will be fully distributed. But this is, this is just a hack because not everyone runs the IPFS network when visiting a website. So you don't really want to do this. Um, what we use instead to make that upgrade is a combination of public IPFS gateways and support from browsers or browser extensions. So instead of having having domain.com point into your local host or the or the local host of the visitor, what you do in domain.com is uh, uh, setting an alias. Uh, point into a public IPFS uh, gateway. Now, when the user is visiting that with a browser, the browser will be able to see if uh, you're accessing something that has a DNS link, something that has a CID associated. And if so, it will be able to capture that request and forward it to your local node if that is installed. And if not, uh, the, 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 the request will proceed you as normal, except that it will be handled by a public IPFS gateway, which is centralized infrastructure, but at least the handling happen, happens transparently. There are two ways of doing this handling of the request. Uh, as a user, you can either install the IPFS companion browsers extension, which automatically detects if what you're trying to visit is something that is hosted on IPFS because it has an IPFS link or it is an IPFS URL, or you can use browsers that support IPFS directly, uh, for example, Brave or Opera. Uh, in this case, uh, yeah, the request can be handled by the local peer gateway. Uh, you can also embed an IPFS peer in the browser. And in the worst case, it is handled by a public gateway. 
IPFS IO or the web that link. And this, this will not be fully peer to peer because you're still depending on the location of a public IPFS gateway, but at least it doesn't break the web uh, for the users. And that's it. We already ran through the demo um, before, but I can also show you that we added some content there. And I can use the CID that ICFS that the web link. HTTP, uh, yeah, HTTPS should work. Oh, yeah. So that, that worked. I was able to access something there, but it doesn't know how to. I know because I have to use CIDB1. Uh, if I do this, you put that link. If I do it like this, Yeah, you see that I'm accessing through a public gateway the things that I show you I was adding on, on the IPFS not before. And here's the, the file that we were playing with. Uh, and so on. The problem that we had was that I was using, I added the things using CIDs version zero and CIDs version zero cannot be used a subdomain, the gateway automatically translated that for me into CAD version one, which is equivalent, um, but it is written differently. And in this case, since I'm using the, since I'm using Brave with the companion extension and everything, um, it's also using my, my, my local gateway automatically. Questions? Once again, I think Discordian is it's kind of answered them all, unless uh, we want to go over any. Um, this, actually, I'm going to say Discordian. Is there any questions we particularly should highlight if you want to talk? Is Discordian going to talk? Oh, yeah, sorry. I forgot that I had a mic attached to my face. Um... <laughs> I, I thought you might be purely a bot at this point. So. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I don't think so. If anyone that I answered your question, if you feel like it wasn't good enough, uh, feel free to <laughs> ask it again. <laughs> and... It made it sound so awkward that it's like, like someone's going to come up and I was not happy with any of these answers. Answer them again. You never know in text. It can be really hard. <laughs> I know. Um, well, thank you very much. I, I, you pretty much answered like everyone super fast. You did answer everyone super fast. Uh, so that's really appreciated. Um, yeah, no problem. Cool, good. I think that's us. Uh, that sh unless anyone has any other questions that they didn't get a chance to ask or um, didn't feel like was fully covered enough uh, today. Um, anyone have any other questions? Cool. Um, Hector, is there anything, anything else you want to show uh, everyone or is that you wrapped up? Yeah, I was just showing because my note here was re redirecting to the local gateway. Yeah. Um, I was showing that actually using a public gateway, a remote gateway with, with CRIL, using the CIDV1, blah, 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 file one actually got us the same file that we added before. And of course, if we if we pipe it into to IPFS, in this case, with CID version one, it will give me exactly the same, not that, uh, yeah, because I'm, I'm referencing from the root. Um, but yeah, it will give me the, the, the CID here for that file, which is the equivalent to what we've had before. IPFS, the web link. And I don't need the name anymore. That should be the same, right? Okay, very good. Um, yep, that was it. I hope I hope that helped um, everyone to to yeah to understand a little bit better how all the pieces 
come together, there will be way more way more information coming in the P2P presentation uh, in the following week, weeks, and then it will get also very interesting when when all the Filecoin Filecoin things uh, come in. Here are some some links as well. If you want some information about some internals and how things are stored on the data store and all the all the layers between the moment that you add data and how data is changed and how the the, the Merkle DAGs are built and so on, uh, there's an interesting guide here that was written recently and that uh, is actually very technically accurate. So we recommend it. Uh, other than that, I'm super happy to 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 yeah to make this presentation and, and be here to oh, talk well, about our data. Thank you. We're, we're very very appreciative for you, for your times and also this audience time as well. Uh, this evening or morning, wherever you are. Um, so thank you very much, first and foremost, a, a fantastic presentation, extremely thorough and in-depth. I know a lot of people on the chat are saying thank you as well, and I can only echo uh, their thanks uh, to you guys. Um, so much, much appreciated. Um, for the, those who attended today, uh, we next we, we go again next week, next Tuesday, 5.30 p.m. Uh, the intro to Lib P2P is next. Uh, so please do join us for that. Uh, the slides... Uh, we will uh, put, this, put up the slides and YouTube and associated content with this event uh, will go up uh, tomorrow morning, I, I should think. Uh, and so if you do, well, I'm sure you will want to look back at this event uh, and, and uh, use it again. Uh, so uh, we hope to do that and uh, you'll be able to get that content in the morning. And in general, uh, please follow the Discord. Uh, we will keep you up to date with all the events. You should have calendar invites for every future event. Uh, so that's directly in your calendar. There's also an event right. Uh, that Danny has put in the chat and will be reiterated in the Medium and YouTube tomorrow. In the meantime, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you again, Hector and Discordian, for your time this evening. I'm looking forward to seeing you in future weeks and have a good uh, rest of the day uh, wherever you are. Thank you very much, all.